Hi, I'm Angela Fair. I'm here to help you become your own favorite watercolor artist. I've squeezed out just four greens here and uh, two of them are greens you're probably going to see fairly often in a watercolor palette uh, if you're buying a kit or a set. The other two are colors that I would personally choose if I could only have two greens in my palette these are the ones I would choose. So let's take a look at those. Um, we're going to start with Viridian. Viridian is a color you probably have heard of before. Viridian green is uh, this guy up here and as you can see as I'm spreading it out it's a bluish green and I would call it kind of a mid-value green. You're never really going to get a super dark value from Viridian. It's always going to be kind of in that middle tone and so that makes it a little bit hard to mix and that's one reason I actually don't keep Viridian in my palette is if I'm going to choose a green, if I just have room for a few greens in my palette, I want uh, a dark value green that's going to be nice for mixing. Another color you're going to see fairly often in a watercolor palette is sap green. This is deep sap green so it's a darker um, sap than uh, you might have in your palette if you have a sap green. I'll just blot it so you can kind of see the, ver the range of values you might get. Um, sap green is kind of I would say like an earthy green. For many years this was the green that I used to when I wanted to paint trees and leaves and uh, have just a green at hand. And I haven't used sap green much over the last few years and I'll be talking about why that is uh, later in the video. The two greens that I would recommend if you had to, ch if you only could choose two greens for your palette are Thalo Green right here and you can see it's a lot like Viridian in uh, kind of temperature and the color quality. It's just a lot darker and richer looking and then the other is the green gold and green gold as you can see uh, almost looks yellow especially in comparison to these other greens. Uh, here we have really two warm greens, the sap green and the green gold and two cool greens and you can see they're, they're very cool. They look like they'd be really nice in ocean water. And uh, so the reason I would choose phthalo green and green gold for a beginner palette, for a basic palette, uh, are because they offer a lot of diversity. Using those two colors, you can mix a lot of really great and interesting greens if, you're, <laughs> if you mix them with other colors in your palette. Uh, phthalo green, you can mix with red to get a near black. We're going to use pyrrole red, which is right here. If I grab a little bit of my phthalo green, a little bit of pyrrole red, and I start mixing, I need a little more green. If the color looks too warm, you add the cool. And if it looks too cool, you add the warm. It's just as simple as that when you're trying to mix that neutral. There we go. So there we get our black. Um, you can mix a really nice, rich, dark using your red, your tomato red, um, probably even using a magenta, you're going to get a really nice, uh, rich, dark. There's the magenta. Let's try it. It's going to be a cooler dark because the magenta is a cooler red and the phthalo green is a cooler uh, green. Yeah, it's a really dark violet. This is a really dark warm dark. So we have then two options for our darkest darks. If you're mixing a super dark, and I talk about why we mix darks in, la in my previous video on using red, so I'm not going to go over that here. Um, let's bleed those out though and just see what we get. Still a little bit too green up on that one side. And there you can see I've really gotten a violet, so that's pretty cool. Using our phthalo green and our pyrrole red. So we can use the phthalo green to mix darks. We can also dilute it to give us a really soft, cool green. This to me though feels really cool if you're wanting to paint leaves and trees and I think most of the time when students are struggling with painting with greens it's because they're struggling to get the right green for foliage and that's where you really wanted to start doing a little bit of mixing. So if I were to mix a little bit of my red with that green, I'm not loving that actually, we'll just tweak it a bit. My pyrrole red, Again, I'm getting that brownish murky neutral. 
So that's not giving me a pretty green. Again, I'm going with neutrals there, but I know that green and red are complementary, so that if my green is too bright or too cool, I should be able to find something to mix it with to tone it down a little bit. Let's try a yellow. Uh, let's try Oriolan, and we'll add that with our phthalo green, and that gives us a really nice bright spring green. So if we go in between, if we choose a red, or an orange I mean, we choose an orange. I'm going to choose quinacridone sienna. You can see this is kind of the orangey tone that it is. If I mix that with my phthalo green, there we get our foliage color. Isn't that nice? I can keep varying the warmth of that color and I can start to see this beautiful spectrum of earthy greens, greens that you're going to find in nature. And that's really what I want when I'm working with green. Choosing phthalo green, it's really unnatural, it's really vibrant, and if you're wanting to paint greens that look natural, you might be deciding to try to, to, try to go with the sap green, but you get so much more versatility when you choose a bright, off-putting, unnatural neon green and then you can start to mix your own beautiful earth-toned greens using a little bit of an orangey color or of course a yellow and red combination is going to start to give you that uh, na more natural green as well. So that is why I would choose phthalo green if I could only put one color of green in my palette it would be the phthalo green. I like having green gold on hand too, however, because green gold gives me the opportunity to create that beautiful glow of luminous greens. If you're in the forest and the sun is streaming through the trees, you're gonna get a color that's a little bit like this. And yes, you can mix it using, using a yellow. Uh, I really find it's fun to have this color on hand. And that's really my number one reason why I would recommend it is because I just love it so much. And uh, so that's what you're getting. But if I add cobalt teal to my green gold, I get a really beautiful rich green. It's a little, little bit opaque, a little less transparent than I might get with the phthalo green. And uh, it's got that same vibrance to it. I can also take uh, my quinacridone magenta. It's a little bit cl cloudy and dirty right now. I just need to clean the top of my palette. Uh, anytime you get dirty color on your palette, you're just going to wipe it off. And there, it's back to my bright, pure color again. And using green gold with that gives me a really fascinating neutral that I always love playing with. kind of a vibrant orangey brown color. And, uh, but not only that, but they look really nice side by side. You have that bright magenta, and then rather than choosing a dark green, and then the both colors look kind of uh, stronger dark values, to create that lovely, my magenta has some real flow to it today, to create that lovely counterpart in a light value green is really beautiful. So that's why I like green gold. Uh, again, phthalo green is a really great color for learning how to mix your greens. Adding that orange in gives you those earth toned greens that you're going to have a lot of fun with when you're painting foliage. And all you have to do to change up uh, one, you know, painting one tree and then painting a different kind of tree beside it is slightly alter the proportion of uh, warmth inside of mixed in with that green. One can be slightly richer in the Quin Sienna. Burnt Sienna uh, should work as well. Choosing an orangey tone uh, gives you that lovely uh, earthy mix for your greens. Oh, and if you don't have phthalo green, uh, you can add a little bit of yellow, a nice clear transparent yellow, to your phthalo blue, or in this case, this is phthalo turquoise. And I can mix my phthalo green from there. Really, when we talk about buying colors that aren't red, yellow, or blue, uh, the reason we're doing that is so that we have the ease of just being able to dip into that color rather than having to mix to get that base color and then adjust it to suit our painting. So it just kind of eliminates or 
decreases the amount of mixing and gives you some more instant uh, choices there. So this is my phthalo turquoise mixed with my Oriolan. And then if I added some Aussie red gold, you can see I can get uh, myself a nice uh, foliage kind of green tone that's nice and rich. There are also times when greens need to be shadowed. And so if you're working to make uh, shadowy greens, often, and we're gonna use the, the sap green for this, and just spread it out a little bit. So here's some sap green, and it's a kind of a shadowy color as it is. But if we want to put some darker shadows into the green, so often we think about working with blue and adding blue. But in this case, and this is ultramarine, which is a fairly dark value green. But blue isn't always a great choice when added to green. Uh, because it can often actually make the green look a little bit brighter, especially with this deep sap green. And so a better choice, a better option, would be to choose a violet. I'm um, going with carbazole violet. Um, dioxazine violet would work as well. And use a really nice dark violet for your shadows. And you can see how much more um, shadowy that looks than the ultramarine blue. So we've just made all kinds of interesting greens on, on our paper here. One thing to keep in mind is it's really important to remember that changing greens when you're mixing colors, uh, when you're painting with a lot of greens and foliage, you want to remember that value matters a lot too. And let's take a look at that. In the next part of the video, I'll be sharing with you how you can use just one or two greens to create unity and variety in your painting. And we'll be painting a little uh, demonstration scene. Today's lesson is on using green, but I've also shared some tips on using red, which can be a really hard color to work with. You can check that out using the link on your screen. I'm here every week sharing tips and tutorials for watercolor lovers. If you want more structured content and a watercolor community where you can grow your skills and collaborate with other artists, you're going to want to check out my website at angelafair.com. I've got information on how you can sign up below. If you found this video useful, I'll be sharing more on color theory and how to use different colors in your watercolor and how to mix color more confidently in future lessons. So don't forget to subscribe and don't forget that there are links below the video where you can track down the supplies I've used in today's lesson. Leave a comment for me. Let me know what you're struggling with in your watercolor journey and what you'd like to see in a future video. Do you like using green? Is it a hard color for you? Tell me all about it uh, down below. Comment, subscribe, and then we'll get on to the rest of the lesson. So let's say we're painting and I'm going to choose, I'm gonna choose some different greens just so you can see a few of the ones in my palette that I enjoy using. Uh, we're gonna start with the green gold though. Back to green gold. So we're gonna start and we're painting some bushes here. This is hot pressed paper, so it's uh, this time, so it's a little bit soft and flowy. So here's one green. And then we have, oh, this is Kingman Green Turquoise made by Daniel Smith. It's kind of uh, a similar tone to, or similar color hue to Viridian, I often think, maybe a little bit paler. So we put that in. We grab some Cascade Green because we want another kind of bushes over here. We'll make these a little bit spikier. Cascade Green uh, works really well in washes because it separates and some blue appears in the underlying wash. And then we want a dark green. Let's do an, a big evergreen tree. And then for this one, I'm going to use Zoocyte Genuine, which is kind of a guilty pleasure. I love this grayish dark green. And this is going to be, this, this evergreen tree doesn't feel like it's going to go well for me today. It knows I have a camera on, so it's being obstinate. Okay, so here we have four different greens that I just used. And what's happening in this painting is absolutely zero unity. Uh, each of those greens has its own identity, its own characteristics, its own temperature uh, between warm and cool. Um, they vary in value. Um, I've got a light green, I've got kind of some middle greens, and then my darkest green. 
So, you know, wh why aren't they working? Why don't they feel like they fit together? But they need a unifying element to really make them work. And that's why you want to learn how to mix greens. Instead of just having five or six greens in your palette and changing it up as you paint, you want to learn how to mix so that your colors feel unified. I do sometimes work with two greens, uh, two di very different shades of green uh, in a painting. But when you start placing a whole bunch of different tube greens beside each other, they do tend to start looking a little patchy um, and separate. And so it, it really does flow much better if you combine them. So <laughs> this time we're gonna start real quick. Um, and we're going to start with, we're going to use just two greens this time. We're going to use the zoocyte and we're going to use the green gold. Um, the zoocyte just because I love it. And uh, so we'll start with the green gold again and paint our, our bushes. And we'll keep those fairly bright and pure. And then we'll grab our zoocyte and paint our big tree. But I've grabbed a little less this time and I didn't clean my brush in between. So there's a hint of green gold in my zoocyte as I'm painting here. And that already is going to tie these two greens together in a way I wasn't getting in the other painting when I kept them quite separate. And it's always good to have a second try at a tree that didn't go well. I like the feeling of this one. But then at this stage, I might also decide that I want to build up um, some depth. So we're going to grab and unify using some of the other colors in the scene. So I'm going to grab some Quinn Sienna. I'm going to put some warmth into the middle of my tree here. And we talked about Quinn Acridone Sienna um, being a really nice color to mix to get that neutral or kind of to give your bright, two bright greens an earthy tone. And in this case, that quinciana is giving our zoocyte, which is actually quite a cool color, just a little pop of warmth. I'm also going to choose to mix a little green gold and quinciana over in my palette. And I'm gonna add a little bit of ultramarine blue because I can use my green gold a lot, often I can use my green gold like a yellow. So now I have green gold, a little quinciana, and a lot more ultramarine blue. I'm going to paint this bush over here. And I think I want it a little lighter in value than that, so we're going to add some water. And a little straight ultramarine to create a shadow. And I know I said about using violet, but with this warm green, I think a cool violet might work. Uh, it's not, there's never just one way to do anything. And then we have that spiky bush we wanted to paint over here. This time we're going to go with the ultramarine and the green gold and paint that spiky bush. And then if we wanted to create a few more depths, maybe then I would um, add a little bit of, a little hint of violet. Let's try it into the base of this bush and see how that works. A little bit of bleeding there as things are drying. And then if I wanted to tweak my evergreen tree further, I could try adding in some of my shadow blues in there as well the ultramarine that I used for mixing elsewhere. So the colors I've been using, instead of using four different greens, I've used two greens, my zoocyte and my green gold, and I've used the burnt sienna, or the rock, the quinacridone sienna, and the, the blue is really taking over there, and the ultramarine. So I have four colors still, but because there's little bits of ultramarine and sienna in different parts of the painting, there's a lot more unity happening here. And the colors get a little bit more lively when you start mixing color and adding little pops of pure color to a wet area. Um, those are all things that can make your greens a lot more powerful in the painting. And uh, it's a lot of fun to explore and experiment what you can do with green 
if you're willing to keep it simple and then do a little bit of mixing in the process. Maybe I want to add a few little foreground marks just to add some uh, interesting line in the painting. And, and if I feel like the tree is too dark, doing a little blotting and lifting there can bring uh, a little more balance to those dark values. So between the two, and we have to overlook the fact that I did get better with painting shapes uh, in the, this little version, uh, but between the two we really have more unity, a more cohesive feel in the color theory, the colors that I used for mixing this little sketch. And uh, if I was doing this as a painting I would have planned in my sky and I would have chosen a sky color that would also have made a good mixing color for my trees and my shadows. And uh, that's another way to create color harmony in your painting. When you're working with green, it's not about having the exact same greens as your instructor uh, or as are listed in a tutorial. It's about choosing uh, strong basic greens that you can learn to mix. And then ha feel free to have fun and play with the greens in your palette and really get to know them. Remember that if they're too bright and powerful, you can add a little bit of complementary color to tone them back a little bit. And because I had such a, a very strong blue green in the phthalo green. Uh, that's really one reason why the orange worked better than the red because it, the green was on the bluer side. Uh, it works better with a red that's also on the oranger side, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, thinking about the characteristics of your colors helps you to know how to mix them more confidently. And a lot of it's trial and error, really being willing to get to know your colors and how they react and respond to the other colors beside them and also mixed in with them. You can become a confident color mixer by working with a small range of colors and getting to know them and how they behave really, really well. From there, you can add to your color palette and uh, with a lot of these fun colors that you see your favorite artists using, um, the colors that appeal to you when you're shopping or looking at the Daniel Smith catalog, and then gradually incorporate new colors into your palette so you get to know them really well as well.